Jean-Pierre Sauvage, welcome to Nobel Week in Stockholm. Thank you. Uh, all Nobel laureates are asked to bring an artifact to donate to the no Nobel Museum uh, here in Stockholm. What did yeah. you bring? I brought some documents. Shall I show you the yes, documents? Yes, please. Yeah. So there was a tradition in my group, um, which was um, at the beginning of the year, of the academic year in October, uh, to have a long, long discussion about the, the research projects we were going to tackle you know, in, the, in the coming year, and also about the, the research projects which, was, which were uh, started before and, and continued um, to know how everything was working. And so I was in charge of this type of seminar, and uh, uh, so it says here, um, research project. I mean, this is, it's a document in French, uh, Présentation des sujets de recherche. I'm pretty sure you can understand. And it was written on um, October 7, 1982. And so this is the authentic document. I mean, uh, even written on uh, a scratch paper, you see the, the back of the, of the sheets. So, uh, so what's in it? What, what's, uh, what's the content of the document? And the, the content is simply the, the various projects we were uh, going to start at that time. And uh, in 1982, um, interlocking molecules like that were basically unknown. And um, I think the, one of the, the main points is that um, so, so they appear in this document, you see here, and there is already a strategy for making them, a strategy for making a, even a slightly more complex catenane. Um, so I believe this is my first written document on catenanes. October 1982, so nothing was published, till one year later, and this is the paper, you know, which kind of uh, represents, uh, you know, what happened between the project and what was achieved. Um, it's a publication which appeared in uh, 1983 in uh, Tetrahedron Letters. Uh, if I may add just one thing, you know, it has something very special. I have published hundreds and hundreds of papers. But there are very, very few papers published in French, written in French. And this one is written in French. It says, if I translate, a new family of molecules, um, metal containing catenanes. Why That's is it written in French? <laughs> it was written in French because, you know, we, we didn't know whether it would be exceedingly important. But we knew that the idea was novel. You know, the strategy was kind of uh, revolutionary in a way. And we knew it was novel, and so we thought we do not take much risk, you know, if we write the paper in French. The people interested in this type of molecule will have to read it anyway. And it's kind of a message, you know, that uh, um, you can also consider that there are other languages than English. So yeah. it was kind of a statement. Yeah, you know, kind of a statement. I mean, it was a bit provocative also, but at that time, you know, I, I used uh, not to be very serious. But do I understand right that it took only sure. one year for yeah. you to yes. actually succeed yeah. with your experiment? Sure. Yeah. So you not for me, for the lady who was doing the work, uh, Mrs. Dietrich Buscheker. Yeah, it's a German name because she was from Strasbourg, and she was an incredibly skillful organic chemist. So she could materialize, you know, the project, convert it to a, a publication, to some, you know, uh, real uh, results. Yeah. Uh, and so I would take this opportunity to thank her, you know, to pay homage, you know, to her qualities. So how long had you been into uh, research uh, in 1982? Uh -huh. Well, I started my PhD thesis in uh, 1968, you know, a good year in France, you know, yeah. it was the, the students' revolution. 
and I was among them. And uh, in '68, uh, although the I think the surrounding was you know very special. I mean there were lots of things happening. Um, I was working pretty hard um, with another friend who was a PhD student with Lane. And um, together, you know, we made the first uh, cage-like molecules, cryptans, cryptates, and that was published in 1969. It was my PhD thesis work, and Jean-Marie Lane won the Nobel Prize in 1987. Uh, to a large extent, you know, uh, in, in relation to this first piece of work, but of course, I mean, he um, expanding the field, you know, um, spectacularly. Yes, I understand. Uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah. What was what what brought you to science in the first place? Uh, in the first place, uh, you know, when you are a kid, I mean, you you know, you try to do what you like. I was good in math. You know, mathematics was kind of my favorite uh, topic. And uh, yeah, that was it. And then I was interested in physics and chemistry, uh, but I preferred math. Okay, uh, so, so it was uh, it was a natural choice for you. It was kind of a natural choice, yes. 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 Uh, and um, how come you started? Uh, you got interested in in just chemistry and maybe even photochemistry. Yeah, um, chemistry. I mean, I always preferred chemistry um, versus physics. Why? I don't know. I mean, I used to do experiments, you know, when I was 16 or 17 years old. Uh, uh, yeah, distillation, uh, um, uh, separating uh, chlorophylls, you know, uh, from plants, things like that. I was mean, this in school? You uh, made these that was at home. That was at home, yeah. I liked that. I mean, you know, it was not very serious, but I liked to do experiments. And, I see. Uh, and physics was was okay, but it was not my favorite topic. Yeah. Do you remember the moment or the the environment where you actually got the idea to lead to to this discovery? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, I think, you know, in some of the recommendations of the, the Nobel Foundation, you know, for the, the Nobel lecture, uh, you know, they suggest you to explain frankly, honestly, uh, how you came up with the ID. And that's what I'll, I'll try to do. Um, it's, um, I remember very precisely, it was coming from photochemistry. You know, we were photochemists. And uh, that's it, chemistry that's triggered by light. By light, exactly. Yeah, uh, chemistry or electron transfer, or uh, you know, very much related to photosynthesis. You know, photosynthesis is very important in nature, uh, and I think the dream of many chemists is to do artificial photosynthesis to convert light energy to chemical energy. Was that your dream too? That was my dream for many, many years. And, uh, you know, doing that, I mean, we had an idea uh, which was pretty simple, uh, which was to use one of the molecules we were working on, you know, a photo, photoactive species, uh, and to make a catenane out of it. And it seemed to be very, very easy. And, and the ketanine that you mentioned, uh, so, if you hold it like that. Sure, then, so this is the... Yes, what is this? Yeah, it's, it's moving, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the very first ketanine we made, uh, which is reported in this publication. The drawings are certainly very naive, you know, here. Yes. They were handmade. Uh, and this is the first ketanine we made in uh, 1983. And it's a totally new type of chemical bond, if I understand it right. It's a new type of chemical bond, yeah. We, Fraser Stoddard calls it the, the mechanical bond. And we have been more, uh, let's say, topology-oriented. 
And so we say that it's a topologically non-trivial molecule or topologically non-planar molecule. This is how um, topologists in mathematics would refer to this molecule, you know, non-planar. Non-planar meaning that you cannot draw on a, on a sheet of paper in a two-dimensional dim space without crossings. You have to have crossings. And it's clear here, you have two crossings. And, and how, how does this uh, uh, discovery uh, take us to the chemical machines? Yeah, that's a very good point. It's very close in a way. Because if you have things like that, you know, two interlocking rings or a ring threaded by an axis, um, you can relatively easily figure out that, you know, a ring can glide rotate within the other ring, or um, the ring threaded by an axis can move along the axis, you know, on which it has been threaded from a position to another position. And this is the beginning of molecular machines. So the movement. Yeah, uh, the movement, the controlled movement. You have to be able to trigger the motion. You know. And how is the motion triggered? Uh, in our case, it is triggered by um, an, an uh, electrochemical signal, uh, not in this particular molecule, but in a molecule which is very similar. And you can abstract an electron or re-inject an electron in the molecule. And each time you do that, uh, you set the molecule in motion, you trigger the motion. Did you have any idea of what the molecule could be, could be used for? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, we and others, I mean, again, uh, Fraser Stoddard, Ben Feringa, and, and now, nowadays uh, many other people. I think the, you know, the work of Fraser Stoddard in particular and his group is really spectacular, um, very much in relation to molecular computing, you know, storage of information, uh, processing of information uh, using molecules. And in what time span do you think we will have the, the ah, molecular? I mean, it's too risky, <laughs> too risky to say. You know, I'm not going to to bet on that. Yeah. How how many uh, failures were there before you got the right chemical reaction to to uh, achieve this? Um, I mean, the first molecule was relatively easy to make, again, thanks to Christiane dietrich bucheker She was a fantastic organic chemist. Yeah, okay. Um, so you, you yourself didn't um, fail didn't, a lot? What, no, not was no. It very, has it been very hard work for you in no, the laboratory? To... Not at all. The idea was good, in a way, and the, the synthetic strategy was good. Uh, also, thanks to her, you know, I insist on that. Um, you know, the work uh, in, in chemistry, the work done by the people, it's, it's a team work. You know. Each time you have a team of people working together and everybody has a, has a function, has a, a contribution, and her contribution was very important. So you were in the same team as, yeah, yeah. as her? Yeah. What's important? What ca different kinds of persons do you need in a team in in chemistry to, yeah. to make these uh, big achievements? Um, I think the first, uh, you know, the first characteristic is to work with people you get along well with, you know, preferably with friends. She was a very good friend of mine. And um, I think the same holds true for the, the students and the postdocs, you know, you have to have very good relations. And the second point is to have people with um, various backgrounds also. I mean, if everybody has the same expertise, you know, in the same field, in a way, it's not, um, it's not going to be very rich in terms of discussions, you know, at group meetings, at coffee or whenever. Um, but if the people have, uh, you know, various backgrounds, I mean, it's very enriching. 
Do you mean uh, mostly scientific background? Scientific you, background. And cultural yeah. too? Or oh, cultural too, of course. Yeah, it adds, you know, to the, to the quality of the, the communication. And how would you describe yourself, your type? Uh, who are you I in say, this team? Uh, <laughs> I think I'm a, you know, easy to interact with person. And I like friendly relations. I mean, to me, it's absolutely essential. What is needed to get this far? I mean, uh, to be re rewarded the Nobel Prize? Uh, I think you have to be motivated, you know. The first thing is not to think of the Nobel Prize, not to think of any prize. Have you never done that during uh, your years as a scientist? I mean, some people told me, yeah, maybe, you know, you, will, you could be on a list or whatever. Each time, you know, I was just laughing and telling them, uh, don't be silly. What's needed more than not thinking of the price? Uh, yeah, I think you have to be motivated. I mean, uh, there are several things. Uh, you have to love science. I mean, you have to love, you know, the idea of making discoveries. Um, and the second thing is yeah, you have to pay attention, to be very, very careful, you know, to potential research projects, you know, you may think of. Uh, every day, you know, uh, every hour, you know, and you have to take any opportunity, you know, when you discuss with your group, uh, when you start a new project, you may have another idea leading you to a different topic, you know, uh, you shouldn't be scared, I think you should jump, you know, and don't, you shouldn't ask yourself the question, will I, will I be able, you know, uh, will I be good enough, you know, to do that? You have to test yourself, you do it. It fails, it fails. And but did you ever have hard times and thinking of just giving up and doing yeah, something sure. else? Yeah, several times, yeah, sure. What, what happened then when it was... I mean, difficult? several projects, you know, didn't lead to, you know, anything. But you never gave up? No, well, I mean, some project, I mean, we gave up, but, you know, if you have 10 projects at the same time, uh, then if one or two projects fail, uh, it's not the end of the world, I think. But you never thought of leaving science? Oh, and... No, never, no, never. That, that, this is my life. Yeah. We've talked a lot about your research and your yeah. career, but what else in life is important for you? Uh, my family. So I get along very well with my wife. You know. Is she a scientist too? No, she's a philosopher. Yeah. Since uh, you know the, the first time we met, which is uh, what more than forty-five years ago, and uh, my son, uh, and also friends are very important you know, to have good friends and to exchange with them. Uh, I love gardening. You do? Yeah, I love do you that. Have a big garden yourself? Yeah, we have a very small garden in Strasbourg, but we have a second house on the Mediterranean uh, in the south of France with a nice garden. So I do a bit of gardening. And do you still uh, hope that you will construct uh, artificial photosynthesis so uh, your flowers yes. can grow? Well, artificial better? photosynthesis, it's a bit ambitious because, you know, the uh, what I hope is that we can convert light energy into chemical energy, make a fuel from uh, light and water and CO2. Uh, artificial photosynthesis in this way, you know, could be realistic. But photosynthesis is much more than that. Yeah. Uh, do you have time to spend with your uh, friends and family, or is almost all your time no. devoted to science? No, no. I think uh, I have. Uh, I have never been uh, completely, you know, uh, focused and only focused on science. I had vacation with my family every year. You know. Do you think that's important to get a lot of other influence? Well, sure. Influence. I think you have to be. If you have to have a if you want to have a balanced life, you know, uh, sure, you have to. Are, are you creative also on your time off from science? Oh, creative, I don't know. I mean, but I think of science, yeah, sure. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much for the interview. And I hope you enjoy your stay in Stockholm now for the rest of the week. Thank you. So the interview was a great pleasure. I thank you now.